All right, everyone, so this is going to be the last recording. So this is for part two of chapter 12. Uh, we will be covering the origins, evolution, and dispersal of anatomically modern humans in this slide set. So we left off last time talking about mid-Pleistocene Homo. We talked about Homo heidelbergensis being the last common ancestor between Neanderthals and modern humans. Homo heidelbergensis lived in Europe and in Africa. The European population seems to have evolved into to Neanderthals, and the African population seems to have evolved into modern humans. Okay, so what's going on uh, in Africa during this time? Uh, we have anatomically modern humans appearing in Africa somewhere around 315 to 330,000 years ago. Again, most likely from a local Heidelbergensis population living in Africa at the time. So what distinguishes um, modern humans from all of these other hominins we've been talking about? Well, it includes gracile anatomy, both cranial and postcranial. So uh, a lot less robusticity in the skeleton, both in the skull and in the rest of the body. So not nearly as heavy or rugged or muscular as some of the other species we've talked about. The brow ridge gets smaller and smoother, and other cr cranial features also smooth out. We also end up with pretty small teeth. All of the teeth end up pretty small, front and back, and we end up with a prominent chin. The chin is something that is unique to modern humans. No other species of hominin has a chin. Uh, we're not exactly sure why humans ended up with chins, but it might have something to do with the overall shrinking of all of the teeth. So basically the idea would be all of the teeth got smaller, the jaw... Um, couldn't really change as quickly as the, the tooth size, and so we ended up with this kind of extra uh, bit of bone where our chin is. Um, but again, nobody's really sure why we have a chin, uh, except that we are the only species that does. Okay, so we are looking at uh, a site in Morocco called Jebel or Hood. This is the earliest anatomically modern human site that has ever been found. It was just found recently, uh, recently found and, and uh, had dates published for it. Previous to uh, this discovery, all of the material that had been found was found in East Africa. So the locations we've been talking about uh, throughout the last couple of weeks. Morocco, of course, is in northern Africa, just south of Spain, so a very, very distant place from where uh, human origins um, were, thought to, were thought to have been um, located. Okay, so Jebel or Hood, Morocco, 315,000 years, uh, modern-looking flat face and brain size. So the face is flat. You can see that uh, here, this face. Uh, this skull overall looks kind of primitive, but um, in most important ways, most significant ways it looks anatomically modern. We do have some archaic looking features. So we have a brain case that's a little on the low side. So if we compare this kind of round brain case to this longer and low brain case, um, Jeb the Jebel or Hood specimen is a little bit more primitive in that respect and does have a larger brow ridge. Uh, okay, so moving on from that, we have a site in Ethiopia that dates to 195 called Omo Kibish. We actually have two specimens that were found there uh, that date to the same time period. One of them has a chin and modern looking characteristics, and one of them is more robust and less modern in morphology. So this Omo Kibish site is really interesting because we have a mix of individuals at the same site. So at 195, instead of having like a homogeneous modern looking population, we have a lot of variation. So there's still a lot of, of primitive looking characteristics that are present in the modern human population at this time. Another site in East Africa at where to uh, 160 to 154,000 years ago, uh, brain size fully modern, 1450 cc's, pretty heavy skull with a large prominent brow ridge. Um, this has been described as being near modern, so kind of on the cusp of being modern looking. Uh, what all of this taken together supports is something called a pan-African model of African human origins. So. Um, meaning we have we have modern humans appearing in lots of different parts of Africa at the same time. It's not just one part of Africa that is kind of like the cradle of, uh, of humanity. 
Okay, so models of human, modern human origins. This is a debate that was really raging back in like the 80s and 90s. It's more or less been settled, but we'll touch on it just a little bit. So models of modern human origins, what we're talking about here is where did they appear and how did they get all over the world? So two primary models that were being debated back in the 90s, the multi-regional model and the recent African origin model. Uh, we'll go through each of these um, each of these separately, but they start at the same place. So they start in Africa with the Homo erectus population. As you can see here, both of these models have Homo erectus populations uh, arising in Africa and then moving out. So at this point after 1.8 million years where Homo erectus has left Africa is where these two models diverge from each other. So the multi-regional evolution model, um, also called MRE, uh, sh holds basically or it held that we have this initial dispersal of Homo erectus out of Africa. So they arise in Africa, they leave Africa at 1.8, they move to all of these distant regions in Europe and Asia, and all of those populations evolve at, um, at the same time um, along the same trajectory. So in this model, it, it's exactly what it, it sounds like. Multi-regional evolution just means that we have many regions where humans appeared um, concurrently at the same time. So this model holds that there's a lot of gene flow between all of these populations. So there's enough um, gene exchange between the Asian and African and European populations that they all stay on the same evolutionary trajectory. We don't have any big branch branching events happen during this trajectory. So the key for multi-regional evolution is that there's no single location where modern humans first evolved. Recent African origins holds that uh, we have a more recent African origin. So again, it's exactly what it sounds like. We do have this original uh, migration out of Africa by Homo erectus at 1.8. We have these Homo erectus populations moving into Asia, Africa, and Europe. At some point, the African Homo erectus population evolves into modern humans. Those modern humans then migrate out again and repopulate all of these other parts of the world, eventually replacing those old Homo erectus populations. So modern humans in this model appear in Africa and only Africa first, and then they spread out to these other places and replace those populations. So in the most strict version of this, there's no accommodation for any interbreeding between all of these different species. It's just humans come in and they replace those old populations. Uh, so we have some predictions here um, for MRE. Uh, it predicts a single evolving lineage, uh, slightly different anatomical trends in each re uh, region, and some of those regional differences uh, maintained through time. Not only that, we would expect to see fossils with intermediate anatomy in all of these parts of the world. So we, we should be able to see evidence in the fossil record of the evolution over time of of the erectus population into human populations. Um, with RAO, recent African origins, we would expect to find modern human fossils first in Africa, and then we would expect to see evidence of two distinct lineages in each region of the world. So we would expect to see some members of Homo, Homo erectus, and then eventually Homo sapiens moves in and replaces those older populations. Now, which of these is true? Uh, from a paleontology perspective, um, we have uh, reasons to assume that RAO is correct. So we do see anatomically, human, hum, anatomically modern humans appear in Africa first, as early as 315. And we do see evidence of, in Europe especially, and in other parts of the world, of a co-occupation. So we have evidence of Neanderthals and Homo sapiens living in Africa at the same, or living in Europe at the same time. We uh, also have anatomical evidence, um, but uh, w one thing that has kind of uh, been discovered in the last few years that has um, kind of revised this issue is the evidence of interbreeding. So this is um, 
from I don't know like ten or so years ago when the first um, and from when the first genetic evidence came out that Neanderthals and modern humans interbred. So we know that these two species were not behaviorally isolated from each other. We know that they weren't genetically isolated from each other. So in light of this new information about this this gene exchange between the two populations, we have to come up with a revised model for human origins. So the revised model that has been proposed, one of them is called the partial replacement model. Um, basically, we see the earliest dates for African modern humans in Africa. We have a dispersal of modern humans out of Africa due to those climate fluctuations we talked about on the last slide set. Modern humans moved into, move into Eurasia, and they hybridize with local groups, including the Neanderthals and Denisovans. Um, so the disappearance of those older species, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, the Homo erectus, could be due to hybridization and replacement. Okay, so I am going to be skipping over some of this. Again, um, same as with the, the last slide set, you will want to make sure that you're following along in the book um, and looking through these slides, even though I am skipping over some of them for the voice recordings. Okay, um, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about um, technology. Uh, so we talked about the Mousterian last time. The Mousterian was used by Neanderthals. It was also used by some humans. So we have use in, the, in Europe and the Middle East between 30 and 300,000 years ago. Um, these tools were used for hunting and scavenging. A lot of these were pretty sophisticated tools. Um, the Aurig Nation is a tool industry that is associated with modern humans. So modern humans specifically in Europe, after they move into Europe af after about 45,000 years ago, they develop a pretty sophisticated type of technology called the Aurig Nation. Um, you can see the pictures here. The pictures, these tools are um, a lot smaller and more delicate. The, the general rule is that the smaller and more delicate uh, a tool is, the harder it is to make. So tool culture is getting more sophisticated, not only with stone tools, but with bone tools. So we have um, greater uh, tool standardization and the use of bone and antler. So these are some of the, some of these are tools that are made out of bone and antler. Um, this item right here is something called a split-based bone point. The split-based bone point was hafted onto um, a piece of wood basically to make a spear. So more standardization to tools and more complexity and sophistication to the tools. We also have definite art objects. Um, this is some of the very earliest representational art that's been discovered. Um, you can see these are animal figurines. Uh, this mammoth from Vogel Herd Cave dates to 36, uh, somewhere around there. We also have this water bird in the bottom, and then over on the right, a lion figurine. It looks like kind of a, a human figure with a lion head. So behavior is starting to change. Things are getting more sophisticated. Tools are getting more sophisticated. We're starting to see art objects. We're starting to see evidence of really human-like behavior. Now, just to skip really quickly uh, over some of this later tool technology, um, the term microlithic means tiny stone tools, basically. So as I said before, the smaller and more complex the stone tool, the more difficult it is to make. So as we move forward and these tools advance and get more sophisticated, they tend to get smaller. Um, we have a couple of Technology uh, groups here, the Gravettian uh, dates to between 20 and 28. Um, we have pretty small pointed blades and Venus figurines. So you've probably seen these before, these highly stylized female figures with large breasts and large hips. Um, not really sure the significant, significance of those, but it's probably some kind of um, early religion. So we have Venus figurines uh, from that time period. Moving into the time period around 20,000 years ago, we have, um, we're starting to see eyed needles. Now, having eyed needles is really important because it lets you make um, better clothing. So you can actually tailor, tailor your clothing and have it 
um, be warmer. Um, so that's important. And then in the Magdalenian, we start to see even more complexity to the tools and we start to see cave paintings. So this is the Lascaux cave paintings. You're probably familiar with these. They are from a cave in France. They date to about 17,000 and they're really, really beautiful, complex uh, paintings on the walls of these caves. So this is not from Lascaux. This is um, from an earlier cave, uh, an earlier site, but you can see we start to see these art objects appearing um, uh, around this time. So what we're talking about here is something called behavioral modernity. So behavioral modernity is distinct from anatomical modernity. So we've been talking about anatomical modernity. What makes a human a human from an anatomical perspective? Well, we have the big brain, we have the flat face, we have the lack of a brow ridge, the chin, all of that kind of stuff. Those are anatomical aspects of modernity. But what makes a human from a behavioral standpoint? So we have a list here. Um, this is not a hard and fast list. Um, other people might make a list of different items, but things that you could attribute to behavioral modernity would be human-like language, as it says here, uh, cooked foods. Cooked, cooking foods is really important. It makes food safer for consumption. Um, it's not technically the worst thing in the world if you were to eat raw meat, it wouldn't kill you. Um, but it spoils very easily, so it's very easily it's very easy for uh, raw meat to become tainted um, and and uh, make you uh, sick quite easily. So cooking foods makes them more digestible, and it also makes them safer to eat. Um, burial of the dead, including ritual components to burial, um, figurative art. We looked at some early examples of that. Also, um, use, using pigments for decoration sophisticated tools, um, exploitation of marine resources. This is something that hints at behavioral modernity because marine resources are more difficult to obtain. So you have to have a specialized toolkit to be able to um, you know, catch large marine mammals or fish or, or anything like that. We also have evidence of, lar of long distance trade um, kind of appearing during uh, this trend. Other aspects, uh, going into a little bit more detail about some of these, uh, speech and symbolic behavior. Uh, again, I've said this a few times over the course of the class, we don't know exactly when modern human speech um, began to develop. It's difficult to say because so much of human speech production is related to soft tissues in the throat. So. The problem, of course, is that soft tissues don't uh, preserve in the fossil record. So really all we have is the shape of a, a tiny bone in the throat called the hyoid bone. Uh, we can look at the shape of the hyoid bone and it's distinct for humans. It's very different for humans than it is for chimpanzees, for example. So if we're lucky enough to find a hyoid in the fossil record, we can compare the two. Uh, we do know that Neanderthals had a very similar highway to modern humans. So from an anatomical standpoint, Neanderthals might have been able to produce human-like speech. Uh, looking at cognitive traits, um, we can't look directly at their brains, but we can look at what they, what they were doing culturally. So we can look at uh, evidence of symbolic thought in the form of art objects, that kind of thing. Uh, the more complexity that a toolkit has, the more um, kind of the, the higher the cognition would need to be to produce it. Uh, genetic studies haven't really gone very far in teaching us much about symbolic behavior or, um, or behavioral modernity. There have been a couple of genes that have um, been associated with modern human language. Uh, the idea would be we can look at, at whether Neanderthals, for example, had the same copy of the gene. Um, those types of studies have not gone as far as, as we would perhaps like. Okay, so 
When and how did behavioral modernity appear? Uh, we have two competing hypotheses here, the continuity hypothesis and the great leap forward. Uh, the continuity hypothesis basically holds that we have a gradual accumulation of modern human behaviors. So starting with Heidelbergensis, we have that site at Cima de los Huesos that's indicating um, an intentional disposal of the dead. So there would have been some kind of symbolic capacities present in Heidelbergensis, and then they just get more complex from there. So the idea with cont uh, the continuity hypothesis is that modernity appears gradually over the course of about 300,000 years. The Great Leap Forward uh, has been proposed as well, and it suggests that there was a sudden event around 50,000 years ago um, that's been nicknamed a human revolution, where some kind of perhaps genetic mutation appeared and spread really quickly throughout the human population that allowed for uh, changed brain function. So basically people that support this great leap forward idea think that something, some kind of change was triggered about 50,000 years ago and that's why we see this explosion of um, artistic expression and stuff like that including the Venus figurines and, and these uh, other types of figurines as well. So there's a little bit of evidence in support of the continuity hypothesis. We have a set of sites. These are all in Africa. Um, three of the four of them are in South Africa specifically. So Pinnacle Point, Clazy's River Mouth, and Blombos Cave are all in South Africa. Katanda is um, in Central Africa. Uh, these are all basically sites that have possible evidence of behavioral modernity uh, really early in time. So Pinnacle Point, we have marine resources. Again, the exploitation of marine resources is difficult, so that's kind of something that's associated with modernity. We also have ochre that's been found. Ochre is a type of pigment, so that has been found at Pinnacle Point dating to about 180,000. Uh, Clazy's River Mouth has hearths with cooked food and exploitation of marine resources. Katanda has, uh, that, that site has um, sophisticated harpoons. And then Blumbos Cave has advanced stone tools and bone tools. We also have evidence that they were making beads. Um, and the, then there's this engraved piece of ochre as well. So you can see it has these little hatch marks um, those were definitely intentionally made. Uh, nobody really knows what they mean, though. The human revolution idea is that there is this spark occur that occurred in Africa about 50,000 years ago. Um, one possible explanation for this is a genetic mutation that occurred and conferred such a benefit on the people that had it that it spread like wildfire throughout the species. Um, one suggestion is that this genetic mutation had to do with language. Uh, that's possible. It hasn't really been proven with any kind of genetic studies or anything like that. Um, the evidence that they point to in support of this idea is that we do seem to have this fluorescence of advanced, of advanced technology that happens beginning about 50. So tools get more sophisticated, art objects start appearing, etc. Uh, and we do have evidence of a genetic um, population bottleneck. Cons, um, the archaeological evidence just isn't there necessarily because we do have all of these other sites. So there's, there's really no, um, there's no explanation for why we see these sites with all of this evidence of of um, human-like behavior appearing earlier in time. Also, it's not testable as of now. Uh, this model is not testable. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna very briefly talk a little bit about this dispersal of modern humans. Um, this is kind of a weird map, but this is Africa up here, this is Eurasia, this is Australia, and then the New World is here. So. This is color-coded, um, down here is the legend, with timing for when human populations arrived in these different parts of the world. Uh, we know that human populations were probably migrating due to shifting climate. As we talked about before, the Pleistocene was a time with re really dramatic climate shifts. So, so we would have had shifting patterns of flora and fauna affecting migration patterns and all that. 
Um, one thing that is clear, though, is that these human populations were capable of what's called cultural buffering. So cultural buffering means that humans were not at the mercy of their environments like other animals are. We have these cultural practices that buffer us from the effects of the environment. So cultural buffering during this time would have included shelters. This is a shelter that's been reconstructed from an archaeological site. It's primarily made out of mammoth bones, so they were making these tents out of mammoth bones. We also have these eyed needles, so again, they're able to tailor clothing to make it better fitting, to make it warmer. So these populations were able to survive in difficult climates because of their cultural behaviors and not just because of their, um, their anatomy and, and whatever else. The peopling of the Americas, there's a lot of debate as to when this happened. Uh, it probably happened somewhere around 20,000 years ago. The most likely route is from uh, Siberia. There's a lot of anatomical and genetic evidence that Native American populations are descended from Siberian populations. So it appears that uh, regardless of whether they came via this maritime route or via this land route, that these populations did come from Siberia. Um, that, uh, again, probably happened somewhere around 20,000 years ago. There is a lot of debate about that, however. So this last slide is just showing, uh, again, where... Um, what the uh, when modern humans are appearing in these different places? This is a little a little bit of out, out of date. It's not uh, reflecting that or that um, recent site that was found at Jebel or Hood that dates to 315. So this other information is more or less correct. But um, so human populations again, the take home message is they arise in Africa, they disperse out into all of these other places, and then. Um, Eventually, all of the other species that exist in all these parts of the world go extinct, and humans are the only species of hominin left.